Hello. Um, for folks clustering around the exits and so forth, there are chairs. <laughs> um, so it's always an honor and a relief to be invited back. <laughs> I feel I haven't totally screwed up. Um, uh, my husband and I, we live in Greece, and we've had um, a very dramatic uh, past six months or so, or um, particularly dramatic. Um, I never really considered myself a political poet, uh, but I've been increasingly asked to write about, you know, what we're going through. I was like, you know, I'm just like a pure poet. I'm just writing my sonnets, whatever. Um, uh, so, I mean, I, I've done, so recently I've done a fair amount of, um, recently, you know, this, it's a crisis that's been going on since like 2010. That crisis maybe isn't the right word, a critical moment. Five years isn't, you know. Um, so, but I've been asked to write more, I've been doing more prose and more, um, so I didn't think I, I really was a political poet, um, but I have, increasingly I've been writing, I'd say, occasional verse that deals with the issues. Um, uh, so for uh, the past six months, I'd been kind of collecting what I call, I have a hashtag thing, not that I even understand what that means, really. <laughs> <laughs> My son could explain it to me, but it looked cool. So like, hashtag, you know, Greek debt crisis haiku. <laughs> I guess maybe I'm hoping other people will join me and add to this in the hashtagness, whatever that means, again. I don't know. I am aware that these are not real haiku. Please don't go into that with me. It's just, just, it's, it's just syllables, people, okay, for me. I know that it's not real haiku. I, I, I get that. But bear with me, as Greece has been saying for some time. <laughs> Europa, we're through. Take back your privative uh vowels. I owe you. Okay, if you're going to clap at the first haiku, we've got to pace ourselves. <laughs> Why is hope the one campaign promise still stuck in the jar, Pandora? <laughs> Tragic ironies. Stock markets not on Wall Street. Here, it's Sophocles. Now, I've had a lot of people ask me about that, and I had to explain to them, no, really, the stock market is on Sophocles Street. It's, it's ironic. <laughs> Snowfall, Parthenon. Is it a miracle or hell freezing over? <laughs> Finance minister. Fashion shoot in Paris match. Swanky apartment. It's like the movies, only not Zorba the Greek, Thelma and Louise. <laughs> Two, Lord Byron, sir. Greek loan approved but held up. Now that you're dead, stop. <laughs> Easter anarchists quit occupying buildings. Crack red eggs, not glass. Alphabet of angst, ugh, is all that's left between drama and drachma. <laughs> I'm, I'm often at dinner parties where people explain to me all the things that are Greek, so this is just Greek words. Panic, oligarchs, democracy, tragedy, dilemma, chaos. Solon promises, wow, this is sensitive. Solon promises to devalue the coinage, 600 BC. <laughs> Grexit, so ugly, so Latinate. What's wrong with Helen Exodus? <laughs> so I'm weirdly <laughs> political things are working out in verse. Now, one of the strange things, and I'm very happy to be doing a, a translation workshop this year with um, 
Charles and with Nigel Thompson, who's here. Um, uh, and Nigel Thompson um, sort of persuaded me um, to be involved in this A Modern Don Juan Cantos for These Times by Divers Hands. And I, I do a canto in here. Um, I wanted to do the, you know, the third canto, which has the Isles of Greece, obviously. Um, but I had agreed to this, I don't know, in 2010, 2009, 2010, maybe, I don't know, 11. I don't know when this started. Um, and then I sort of said, no, I couldn't do it. I couldn't possibly ever do it. Um, but I eventually got persuaded. Nigel's very good at that. Um, but the strange thing is, again, this is actually from several years back, and it only gets more topical. So this is the little little um, lyric poem within the canto, The Isles of Greece, The Isles of Greece, which, if you will remember from Byron, is actually um, you know this shady narrator person who, who shifts all of his... Uh, things to whomever he's talking to. You know, if Pinder sang, sang horse races, what would hinder himself from being pliable as Pinder? So it's all in kind of a uncertain narrative kind of person. But um, again, Trials of Greece. And again, this was actually written many years ago. And what is frightening is I've recently sort of re-brought it to the surface. And people are like, that is so topical. And it just gets more topical. The Trials of Greece. The Trials of Greece, the Trials of Greece, where tragic callous thrilled the nation and shrill Mercury would not cease to ask for the repatriation of Elgin's, their translation garbles. Let's just say Greece has lost her marbles. <laughs> Muses of Ritsos and Kavafi, Seferis, Palamas, Elitis, have they all gone for Turkish coffee or Nescafe? How bittersweet is poetry and song, but lo, who shut down public radio? The mountains look on Marathon, and Marathon looks on the bay. Olympic venue, 10 years on, and nothing's gained, and all to pay. Security still has its demons, despite those hefty bribes to Siemens. Persia now is called Iran. Darius has long gone to dust. Cyprus nixed the Annan plan, and no one takes her banks on trust. Austerity is blind or deaf, and freedom is the IMF. In Constitution Square, conveners deliver megaphonic sermons in the traditional 15ers or blast Philippics on the Germans. Occupation comes full circle. It's also murky. Call it Merkel. <laughs> you know the joke. It's rather droll. Miss Merkel visits this fair nation. And when guards at passport control say name, Frau Merkel, occupation, she laughs a little. Here's the sting and says, nine, I'm just visiting. <laughs> a day late and a euro short, the IMF admits mistakes. Although it's too late to abort, no bureaucrat exaggerates. Austerity, youths in capotes will tell you is in Greek litotes. But blame the politicians, too, who were too busy getting rich. Byzantine teams of green and blue to notice the old bait and switch, no longer can they flaunt their lots. The dry docks chalk a block with yachts. Though hardly any go to jail, each party quick to grant asylum so that when it's their turn to fail and their own newspapers revile them, they wriggle out of the kerfluffle. The decks are stacked that parties shuffle. Give me some Uzo or Retsina with no receipt or VAT. When Xerxes sat on Salamina and watched his tub sink in the sea, he didn't know to thank his luck. Who runs this country runs amok. The unemployment rate is rising with pension when, while pensions sink and prices spike. What is the use of moralizing? Let's have a drink and go on strike, a poet strike. That's what we need. They'll beg us for the latest screed. <laughs> Even graffiti has to rhyme. Even the anarchists must scan. The fascists chant in perfect time. As do the lefties to a man or woman. Slogans, cries, and curses. What is protest? Sands the verses. Europa. Europe, thy very name is Greek. You were a princess once and fair. Wide-eyed, perhaps a little weak, but everyone has flaws to bear. The journey promised wonderful, but the ride you were taken on was bull.
So yes, I've been getting, I guess, weirdly more political, more Byronic. <laughs> Mad, bad, and dangerous to know. Um, and uh, certain translations have come to light. Uh, well, this is, I will put this in. Um, yeah, so Villanelle's, um, they're probably more fun to write than to hear. <laughs> <But> <laughs> After a Greek proverb, uden moti motoron tu prosorinu. It's okay if you don't know what that means because it, it will come back again and again. <laughs> We're here for the time being, I answer to the query. Just for a couple of years, we said, a dozen years back, Nothing is more permanent than the temporary. We dine sitting on folding chairs. They were cheap but cheery. We've taped the broken window pane, TV still out of whack. We're here for the time being, I answer to the query. When we cross the water, we only brought what we could carry. But there are always boxes that you never do unpack. Nothing is more permanent than the temporary. Sometimes when I'm feeling weepy, you propose a theory. Nostalgia and tear gas have the same acrid smack. We're here for the time being, I answered the query. We stash bones in the closet when we don't have time to bury stuff, receipts, and envelopes, file papers in a stack. Nothing is more permanent than the temporary. Twelve years now, and we're still eating off the ordinary. We left our wedding china behind, afraid that it might crack. We're here for the time being, we answer to the query, but nothing is more permanent than the temporary. So even things that would not seem <laughs> political, I think now kind of are in this weird way. Um, the last carousel. You'll, you'll hear it. Um, the horses have seen better days go by with the one eye that peers out on the orbiting world. The other eye has always looked inward to where the moving parts are hidden by a column of gilt-edged, tarnished mirrors. Why are we pierced through the hearts by their poles of polished brass, mismatched orphans, some antique carved of solid wood, some factory molded fiberglass. They course counterclockwise, round and round while time holds them at arm's length. Their feet are shod, but never touch the ground. They've known the shake of reins bidding them race, the heels that drum their flanks urging them faster and faster in one place, the laughter and the outside voices calling, the tinned music stuttering in its rut, the last seasick tide rising or falling. Their gallop is a wave that seizes in their rhythmic progression. They are cousin to the horses, on stolen marble friezes in bas relief in some far off museum that once were pranked with paint. But now that I see them waiting patiently beneath the hives of garish light as one giddy generation mounts and another sulks into the night, one last go, it isn't fair. I am moved by the pivot of their stillness, by their ragged comet tails, of genuine horse hair. This is a, a stolen poem. Um, that's the nice thing about being a poet. You can just steal things. Um, so, uh, uh, Uranis, I may be even mispronouncing that, is a completely obscure um, kind of romantic uh, Greek poet. Um, whose uh, poem gets translated, um, and uh, this is why maybe he's vaguely known. In, but I, I went back to this poem, and I was like, I want to respond to this poem. Donald Justice has run, responded to this poem. And um, it's about all these specifics about how one will die. Um, it sounds kind of morbid, but <laughs> I don't know. It's fun to write. 
Variation on a theme by Uranis. I shall die on an October afternoon under scumbled skies of verdigris in Athens, listening to an out-of-tune accordion from the street, an old reprise of Sagapo, just as when we first came and rented a freezing flat on a steep hill and the same accordionist singing the same refrain would pass beneath the windowsill at the same time every day. You could set the clock by his voice, how it told the exilic hour and the urge to weep hit like an aftershock and grief would edge the tongue like something sour. Though Tuesday's unlucky, I think that it will be a Monday when the summons comes from heaven for the statistician's daughter. You'll agree the chances are pretty good, one out of seven. And Mondays, when the farmer's market comes, with the shaggy roots of things pried from the ground and olives black and blue as hammered thumbs, oblong and shriveled, or compact, fat and round. Whatever you might need, our neighborhood handles. Next door, next to the butcher and the baker and the paraffin shop that makes the votive candles, is the going concern of an undertaker. And we're just five blocks from the first cemetery, though it would take more influence than we've got to get me in. I suppose they'd have to bury me with the foreigners, if I could get a plot. My burial shall be unorthodox, though I don't mind the chants and undertones not being embalmed, dropped down through a plain box, and three years later, they'll dig up my bones. Um, I have promised to read this poem for a couple of times at Sewanee, and then I always fail. I don't know if Cheryl is here. Is Cheryl here? All right. Okay, I'll read this. And also for Jason. Listening to Peter and the Wolf with Jason, aged three. It's probably good Jason's not here. <laughs> Rolling his eyes. We're at the eye-rolling phase. <laughs> Everything is my fault. I don't know if you remember the Sumani where he actually came up here during my reading and passed out of boredom, like <laughs> below the podium. Someone took a picture. <laughs> that will keep you grounded. <laughs> Your own child prostrate with <laughs> prostrate with boredom, like in front of the in front of the podium. Eyes wide open, grinning ear to ear. Balanced between the thrill of fear and fear, he clutches at my skirt to keep me near and will not let me leave him by himself in the living room where Peter and the wolf emerges from the speakers on the shelf. He likes Peter's jaunty swing of strings, the reedy waddle of the duck, the wings that flute up in the tree, but still he clings, even though for now it's just the cat picking its sneaky way through sharp and flat. He isn't frightened of a clarinet and laughs at grandfather's bluster and bassoon, but keeps his ear out for another tune at the shadowy edge of the wood and coming soon. Where is the wolf? He asks me every chance he gets, and I explain each circumstance, though it's not as if he's heard it only once. You'd think he'd know by now, deep in the wood or under the tree or sent away for good to the zoo, I say, and think he's understood. And weary of the question and the classic, I ask him where the wolf is. With grave logic, he answers me, the wolf is in the music. And so it is. Just then, out of the gloom, the cymbal menaces, the French horns loom, and the music is loose. The music's in the room. I do you have another, uh, a few that are Greek kind of centered? Um, this is called Parmenian. Again, I don't really define it because it will be defined in the poem. Parmenian Athens. The air raid siren howls over the quiet, the unrioting city. It's just a drill, but the unearthly vowels ululate the air, a thrill 
while for a moment everybody stops what they were about to do on the broken street or in the struggling shops or looks up for an answer into the contrailed palimpsest of blue. Always we forget. It's once a year, just as lush September's getting sober, ambushed by October. It strikes the heart like fear as the vibrations build to an all clear. The test is dubbed Parmenian after the general second in command to Alexander, implicated by his own son in a confession to a plot of treason, and Alexander had him killed. Old family friend, right-hand man, comrade in arms, probably without reason, a pity, hence the groundless wails, the false alarms. Alice Bewildered. It's one of these things like rereading um, Through the Looking Glass, particularly, which is one I don't reread a lot, and suddenly you come back on these things and, like, wow, that is really weird. So, um, anyway, you remember the wood where things have no names. Deep in the wood where things escape their names. Her childish arm draped round the fawn's soft neck. Her diffidence, its skittishness in check, merged in the anonymity that tames. She knits her brow, but nothing now reclaims the syllables that meant herself. Ah, well, she need not answer to the grown-up beck and call, the rote-learned lessons, scolds and blames of girlhood, sentences to pars and gloss. She's untwinned from the likeness in the glass. Yet in the dark ellipsis, she can tell she's certain that her name begins with L. Lisa, Lacey, alias, alas, alas, alike, alone, and at a loss. So, um, Easter is very different in Greece. It's, 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 it's very much bigger than Christmas, and it's very dramatic and serious, and your kids are constantly hearing about, you know, death and resurrection and so forth. It's not like Christmas, where there's like a nice baby and farm animals, you know. You have to answer a lot more, you know, questions. And also, because I think, like, I think in America, Easter is kind of, you know, it's, it's more fluffy bunnies and stuff. And it's not. In Greece, it's just, it's not about that. It's about, like, we're going to kill this lamb and eat it. <laughs> yeah. D dying the Easter eggs. Dying the Easter eggs, the children talk of dying. Resurrections in the air like the whiff of vinegar. These eggs won't hatch, my daughter says, since they are cooked and dead. <laughs> A hard-boiled batch. I am the children's blonde American mother who thinks that Easter eggs should be pastel, but they have icon eyes and they are Greek and eggs should be, they've learned at school this week, blood red. We compromise, and some are yellow or blue or red and blue assorted purples moves, but most are crimson of a hematic hue, rubbed to a sheen with chrism of olive oil. They will not spoil, as Christian death is a preservative. <laughs> as Jesus trampled death and harrowed hell, their hands are dyed wine red and violet, a mess. Go wash your hands. They wash their hands, punctilious as Pontius Pilate. <laughs> Bless them. Um, so, um, mm, okay. The shadow teacher. Oh, actually, any summer birthdays? Summer birthdays. 
do you remember what this was like, the horrible summer birthday thing? Because, like, all of your friends had, like, birthday parties at school. Yeah, I remember that. I'm a summer birthday. And um, then there was some sort of traumatic thing where your mother brought in cupcakes, but it wasn't your birthday. <laughs> so, it's good to be a poet. <laughs> summer birthdays. In fact, I had my summer birthday at Sewanee because I was at music camp here. Not that this is about that. <laughs> you would learn in kindergarten there was one game you had no part in. Kings and queens of endless noons, you envied them their golden rule in crowns of bright construction paper. The cupcakes, streamers, brave balloons, the breath and the expiring taper. Later, there were those at school whose invitation list would pique the class's interest for a week. Sleepovers, where all was said or giggled about who liked whom, and anyone who left the room would have only herself to thank as but of some unfunny prank. Sleep sneaked in at dawn. Instead, you always seemed to be at camp. Slouched on a picnic bench, still damp from swimsuit bottoms. Next to one, your brief best only friend for three long weeks of forced hilarity, arts and crafts and nature fun. You stared down at your ugly sandals, hating the song and the stupid candles. In the dog days, playing dead, there still lies a sense of dread, something in you that accrues as you watch the summer blaze through the cyclopean days, the wine-dark sea of summer blues, fierce skies extinguished one by one when the dusk blows out the sun. Most everything you love was born at the cusp of harvest time when the year was in its prime, before the autumn winds had torn the turning pages from the trees and rent the spider's thread of pride and brought the flowers to their knees. Every summer, like a tide, the anniversaries arrive, unclockwise with the clockworth earth, sister, mother, daughter, son, yourself, and then the other one, your father, were he still alive. Every August you have cried when you celebrate his birth ten days after he has died. And maybe it's not only dad, but summer too. It's vague alarm, another year, another gone year's epitaph. The year still seems to start with school. Fresh pencils, new hopes to be cool, while summer evenings, late and sad, and violet and moist and warm and fading like a mimeograph. For those who remember what that is. <laughs> well, this fits in with that. The shadow teacher. I, I love phrases like this, the shadow teacher. You know, <laughs> it's like, there's a shadow teacher? <laughs> I'm very literal minded. <laughs> I teach them to behave just like the rest. They're marked as absences, take up no room. They only raise their hands when others do. They never speak, even when spoken to. At noon, they always win at hide and seek. They love follow the leader, never picked, not even last on either side for ball. They never cry, however much they fall. The buddy system works, and so I pair them with a student who's a stolid match. Although they're clingy, they are quick to learn single file and share and wait your turn. They do not count. They only know subtraction. Their hands glide noiselessly across the page, lefties mostly erasing as they go, downcast as school lets out, they stretch and grow. the stain. Remembers your embarrassment. Wine or blood, sweat or oil. When the ink leaked your intent because you thought no truth could soil or when you let the secret slip or when you dropped the leaden hint or when between the cup and lip the Beaujolais 
pled innocent, or when the rumor's fleet was launched, or when the sheets waged their surrender. But the breach could not be staunched, and no apology would tender. When overserved, you misconstrued and blurbed your heart sick on your sleeve. When everything became imbued with sadness, yet you couldn't grieve. Inalienable as DNA, self-evident as fingerprints, it will not out, although you spray and pre-soak in the sink and rinse. What they suspect the stain will know. The stain records what you forget. If you wear it, it will show. If you wash it, it will set. I write a lot of poems about laundry <laughs> rather than doing the laundry, <laughs> as my husband can tell you. In fact, here's a laundry poem. I also um, am supposed to be like finishing um, Hesiod's Works and Days, um, which is the first instance we have um, of the story of Pandora and the box, not uh, of the jar, not Pandora and the box, but Pandora and the jar. It's Erasmus who makes it a box. Um, and it's not like a little jar, it's a pithos, so it's, it's like a whole person could fit in it. And she wrenches the lid off with her bare hands. And also you think, and I actually have this in the poem, but I'm wrong about it. Um, in narrative, you know, you think, okay, the gods tell her she's not supposed to open it, but she does. But actually in Hesiod, no one tells her not to open it, she just opens it. That's something we add on in our memory of how this story should go. Um, so, uh, well, I went with Erasmus on that. Um, so, yeah, this is another laundry. I, I was also told that I have a lot of marital argument poems. A, a, a critic pointed that out. And I, I think um, uh, arguments put me in a poetic frame of mind. <laughs> like, rather than apologize, <laughs> I'll, <laughs> I'll write a poem. So. <laughs> a jar. The washing machine door broke. We hand washed for a week. Left in the tub to soak, the angers began to reek. And sometimes when we spoke, you said, we should not speak. <laughs> Pandora was a bride. The gods gave her a jar but said, don't look inside. You know how stories are. The can of worms denied. It's never been so far. Whatever the gods forbid, it's sure someone will do. And so Pandora did and made the worst come true. She peeked under the lid and out all trouble flew. Sickness, war, and pain. Nerves frayed like fretted rope. Every mortal bane with which mankind must cope. The only thing to remain lodged in the mouth was hope. Or so the tale asserts. And who am I to deny it? Yes, out like black-winged birds, the woes flew and ran riot. But I say that the woes were words, and the only thing left was quiet. I'll end with a couple of little poems. Um, I tried to write a spooky poem. I don't know. You can tell me. The Blue Balloon. That night, I'd padded to the children's room as mothers do to drink the sound of sleep, but stopped in the doorway and could not go in. Something stood watching them. The blue balloon that rose there like a disembodied head at human height. It had lost half its lift, or if it had a body, one string thin that hung limp as a noose and trailed the ground. It was perhaps a draft that made it swivel slowly as a head might turn and look, or rather, since it had no eyes, regard me where I stood stopped on the chilly threshold. Daytime, of course, it was a blue balloon. Half out of helium, halfway between the ceiling and the floor, I seized its throat and scissored all the buoyance out of it. Later, when the lights went out for just two seconds, maybe, and there was a noise that thumped from deep inside the icebox while my heart clutched also, it was like a fist pounding from release from under a lid. When it stopped, 
I laughed at how I'd been unnerved by a freak of surging current. Later, when I lay down in my dark room on the bed and waited for the headache to dissolve, the bitter chalk of pills still in my mouth, I wept and did not dare open my eyes as nothing held my hand and held my hand. Okay, so last two. Um, so I do live in Greece, and we, we swim in the beautiful Aegean, which is very different from swimming in, like, the reservoir, um, which is very beautiful, and it's got all these wonderful trees, but you can't see, you know, with two inches under, you can't see, which I'm now used to the Aegean, where you can see, like, right to the bottom, and that feels more comfortable. And you can see all the sea urchins, but they're far away. Um, but anyway, I am the one who, of the family who always gets the sea urchin spikes. I don't know. They... So I thought I'd write them a poem, and I have not been sea urchin spiked since I wrote this poem. <laughs> so maybe it's worth it. I don't know. Sea urchins. Okay, and, and these are haiku stanzas in a just sort of basic sense of counting syllables. I know they're not real haiku. It's just the syllables. The sea urchins star the sea floor like sunken mines from a rust-smirched war filmed in black and white. Or if they are stars, they are negatives of light. Their blind beams brittle purple needles with no eyes. Not even spittle and a squint will thread the sea's indigo ribbons. We float overhead like angels or whales with our soft underbellies just beyond their pails, their dirks and rankles. Nothing is bare as bare feet, naked as ankles. They whisker their wrists in the fine print of footnotes, irksome asterisks. Their extraneous complaints are lodged with dark dots, subcutaneous ellipses. Caesars seldom extract even with olive oil tweezers. Sun bleached, they unclench their sharps, Doom scalps their hackles, unbuttons their stench. Their shells are embossed and beautiful calculus, studded turbans tossed among drummed pebbles and plastic flotsam, so smooth, so fragile. Bobbles like mermaid doubloons, these rose, mauve, pistachio tinted macaroons. And I'll close with weathering. The rain is haunted. I had forgotten. My children are two hours abed, and yet I rise, hearing behind the typing of the rain its abacus and digits, a voice calling me again, softer, clearer. The kids lie buried under duvets, sound asleep. It isn't them I hear, it's something formless that fidgets beyond the window's benighted mirror where a negative develops, where reflection holds up a glass of spirits. White noise precipitates. Rain is a kind of recollection. Much has been shed, hissing indignantly into the ground. It is the listening belates, haunted by these finger taps and sighs behind the beaded curtain glistening, as though by choices that we didn't make and never wanted, as though by the dead and misbegotten. <laughs>